Hello. Hello. Thanks very much for the invitation. So uh, I'm very happy today to try to give you another dimension of this whole field, which is the mathematical side. We are currently living a phenomena which is quite strange, which is that you have these spectacular algorithms producing amazing results, but we basically don't understand what's happening, how come these results are obtained, and what is the underlying mathematics. So that's what, that is what I'll be speaking about today, and trying to just give you an intuition of what are the main mathematical issues without obviously going into the details. So uh, there is at École Normale Supérieure right now a center which is being put together, which is totally multidisciplinary between uh, physics, mathematics, computer science, uh, cognitive sciences. And uh, there is also a new chair at uh, Collège de France. So uh, for the one interested, uh, you'll be able to uh, follow the courses. OK, so the problem I'll be addressing is the general issue uh, of learning. In learning, the big difficulty is that we are dealing with data which have a very high dimension. Think, for example, as the data X being an image. An image has about one, billion, one million pixels, which means that you can view an image as a point in a dimension, a very high dimension, one million. And what are we trying to do? We are trying to associate to an image X the label. For example, in the example that I'm showing here, the label may be uh, anchors, Joshua trees, beavers, lotuses, water lily. And to do so, in other words, what you want is to learn or approximate a function f of x. As you know, you have the examples. In other words, a set of images, xi, for which you are given the labels. Now, when you look at that, the big difficulty that you immediately see is that, obviously, images of beavers can be totally different, huge variability as well as Joshua trees or lotuses. In other words, you need to kill this variability and to do so, in some sense, you want to find what is common within all these classes, and these are called invariants. On the other hand, your invariants have to be sufficiently powerful in order to be able to distinguish these different classes. So from a mathematical point of view, the theme of invariant symmetries is at the center of the topic. So you can view that for images, but essentially the problem is the same if you want to learn, for example, physics. So in physics, x will be the state of the system. So it can be, for example, the distribution of mass in the universe, or it can be the geometry of a molecule. And the question is, can you learn a physics without any physicist? That would mean, for example, can you learn, without knowing anything about Schrodinger equation, to compute the energy, the quantum energy of a molecule, just given some data, some example of molecule, for which you do know through experiments the value of the energy. What we know in physics is that at the core of physics is the existence of symmetries. All forces, interactions in uh, particle physics are derived from the knowledge of symmetries. So we know that the same concept is going to be there somewhere. OK, so why is it so difficult? You have this so-called curse of dimensionality that I'd like to come back to. Think of it. The problem doesn't look so difficult if you watch it immediately, you have example xi, you have the value of your function f, f of xi, sorry, this is in French, like that you'll learn a bit of French for the one who don't. And imagine you want to do classification. So for example, I have a new point x, I want to know the color of x. The immediate idea that comes to mind is to say, let's look at the color of the neighbors, and here they are mostly green, so it's likely that x is going to be green. And that should work pretty well if the function f of x is regular. So why is that never going to work in our problems? It's never going to work because you have no close neighbors. In high dimensions, the points are completely spread in space like the stars in the universe, even worse. And to have an idea how much they are spread, and to understand that, let's look at the cube, 0, 1, in dimension d. OK? So think of it in two dimensions first. Suppose that you want to make sure that all your examples are far away by a distance 1 over 10. 
How many points do you need in dimension 2? 10 multiplied by 10, 100. If you're in dimension D, you'll need 10 to the power D. If D is 100, 10 to the power 100 is already more than the number of atoms in the universe. And we're not going to be in dimension 100, but rather 1 million. So yes, you may have millions of examples that looks a lot to you, but that's nothing compared to the size of the space. What does that mean? It means that in general, the only thing that you'll be able to learn are very, very simple functions, very simple things. And the whole problem is to understand how come the problems we are facing, in what sense they are simple. Now, a key idea that is going to come all along is the idea that very often these problems are simple because they can be structured in a cross scale. So think of it, suppose you have a certain number of particles like that in an electromagnetic field. They are all going to interact one with the others. Think, for example, of people in a social network. Yes, but on the other hand, where are the very strong interactions? The very strong interaction is yourself with your family, or a pixel with the neighbors, or the particle with the close one. The more far away particle, they do interact, but you can summarize their interaction by grouping them. For the very far away particles, you can group them in even bigger group. For example, you don't have to consider the influence of all the Russians on yourself. You can summarize potentially as the concept of Russia, which may have tension with France, which may, for example, interact on your own life. Now, these ideas of regrouping across scales means that instead of having d squared interaction, you'll go to log d interactions, and you are going to break this curse of dimensionality. And that immediately puts us close to a topic in mathematics, which are called wavelets, which is the topics about multiscale. OK, so what's the relation with neurons? You all know what is a neuron. Basically, it's a, a, a system which takes a, a set of input here, x1, xk, makes a linear combinations of this input, puts a nonlinearity, here is a rectifier, so lets the output be non-zero only if the values are above the threshold. Then what we do in neural nets is you organize these neurons in a network with different layers one after the other. So obviously in these neural nets you have a huge number potentially of parameters, which are the weights of the input of each neuron, and as you know, you optimize these parameters by making sure that the output on the examples you know does correspond to the value that is given to you by the example. In other words, you make sure that the prescribed output corresponds to the one that you want. And to do that, you make a gradient descent by backpropagation. What is very important is that this network has a lot of prior information. And where are you going to put the prior information in the structure, in the architecture of the network? And that's where comes the beautiful work of Jan Lecun. What is very specific about what had proposed in the end of the 90s Jan Lecun is the architecture. If you think about it in the case of images, the first thing is that if you look the red point in uh, the second layer here, it's going to depend upon a certain number of points in the input image of a first a very small neighbor, and the weights are invariant to translation. That's called a convolution. That means that you have a notion of symmetry. Your problem is invariant to translation. That's what you impose within the network. The second important thing is that everything is organized uh, within these layers, and the output is going to be a linear combination of, or some potential nonlinearity here of the last layer. So in this network, you have billions of weights, and as you know, you have very spectacular results. The question from a mathematical point of view is to understand what are the classes of functions that can be approximated by such a network. We know that it's a very small class compared to the set of all possible functions that we may encounter. We know that they must be simple in some sense because they are defined by only a billion parameters, which is very small compared to the curse of dimensionality. What are these classes? 
this is the central question from a mathematical point of view. So, how can you study that type of problem? Oh, yes. One important point is that depth corresponds to scale. Why? If you take the first point red in the first layer, they are going to depend upon a very small number of coefficients. If you go to the next layer, because you are cascading operators which are local, you are in some sense progressively aggregating more and more and more coefficients in a neighborhood. If you go to the last layer, a uh, green point will depend upon points over a very large neighborhood. So as you go deeper in your network, you aggregate over larger, larger, and larger scale. You organize things across scale. That's how you can think of these uh, depth coefficients. The other thing is that the first layers, the weights, looks like something we know well, which are these so-called wavelets. Okay, why is it important to understand? It's not just for the pleasure of thinking, it's also because right now engineers spend a huge amount of time on an error and trial basis, and you may get very big errors with very small modifications of the input. This is an example where you see these images which were all correctly classified. You add a very small error and suddenly the AlexNet tells you they are all ostriches. Now this is the kind of error you don't want to have if your network is controlling the airplane in which you are. To understand how to eliminate that kind of problem, you need to understand the mathematics. Now, what does it mean to have a simple function? I spoke about the notion of invariance. Suppose you want to classify digits. If you take a three, if you translate, you deform it, it's still a three, okay? If you take paintings, if you make a small deformation, the paintings is essentially similar. When the deformation gets very big, the painting is different. What does that mean? It means that your function is invariant when you translate, because the object doesn't change, the label is the same, and when you make small deformations. And that brings you to a totally different domain of mathematics, which is geometry. If you remember, when you solve your second degree equations, you have nice formula to solve them. Beginning of the 19th century, Galois asked the questions, can we do the same kind of thing over equation of degree five? What's the relation with deep net? I'm going to explain you. And he proved that there was no formula, and how did he prove it? He looked at the equation, y equals f of x, and the beautiful idea he had is to try to understand what are the set of transformation among the solution of these equations. The set of transformation, these are the symmetries of the problem. And the equation is invariant to these symmetries. What he observed is that if you understand the symmetry, you understand the function. The problem is the same for us. What do we know? Our function is invariant to translation deformation. We need to use that to understand the nature of this uh, function. And how to use it? By putting the same invariance in the networks. So, when you begin to understand and to try to analyze that from a mathematical point of view, you need to understand what are the operators which will build up that kind of invariance. And that's where you naturally arrive to these wavelets, to these multi-scale ideas. So if you're a mathematician, you try to do things in a very simple way. Can I build a network without learning, just with the prior information, which is I know that the problem is invariant by translation, stable by deformation. If you just put it that way, the answer is yes. Not only it's yes, but you arrive to the same kind of architecture as the one that Yann Lequin has put together. And you build a network with fixed weight which are defined entirely by these so-called wavelets. So what is potentially the advantage? If you learn less, that means you need less data because you use prior information, so you can begin to work on data sets which are much smaller. On the other hand, are you doing as well as general deep network? I'll show you no, very far from that. 
So how can you do well with these networks where you just use prior information on the symmetry? You will essentially do well on problems which respect these symmetries. For example, these examples of recognizing digits, the variability is essentially translation deformations. So this deep network will give you state-of-the-art results because you know the type of symmetry and you've put them by hand in the network. Same thing for the textures. If you want to compute the energy of molecules in quantum chemistry, same thing. It will work out because you have the same kind of symmetries. On the other hand, if you want to deal with ImageNet, where the problem is much more complicated, there are symmetries which are much more complicated than just this translation deformation. What looks like is that these deep networks are able to learn the symmetries of the problem. And that's very spectacular. They are able to learn and adaptively build the invariant just based on the data. How are they doing that? We essentially have no ideas. And it's a very fundamental problem because the ability to learn in symmetry means that you can learn physics, that you can learn a, a huge amount of structure in the world. And as I said, it really comes as a surprise that it is possible to do it. Sorry. I would like just uh, to finish by saying that uh, in order to try to build this bridge between, on one hand, application, numerical uh, elements, and mathematics, we've been putting together a website, which is over there, which proposed challenges for courses all across uh, France in mathematics, statistics, uh, data learning. So if you are a startup that you have a very nice problem with uh, data sets that you are ready to share, then you can provide it within this challenge, everything. So it's a kind of Kaggle challenge, but it's free and it's organized for teaching. For the people who uh, want to recruit, have intern, it's a way to discover uh, very bright young students who will be working on uh, your problem and see who could uh, be of interest for you. And for the scientific community, it's a way to understand what are the real problems which are important within industry or within a scientific lab. So uh, for the one interested, there will be a course in the Collège de France that I'll be beginning. So these courses are open to the public that will be uh, beginning in uh, January and which will really be about the mathematics of learning and all these beautiful open issues around deep nets and much more. Thank you very much. I'm